So, Concept Crucible Podcast, Episode 2. Was that you starting the podcast, or was that... Sure, why not? Was that... <laughs> I'm not sure what that what that was. Are we, are we, did we start with a slow clap now? Uh, no, 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 no. The, the whole thing, I was talking about it before the first podcast of... An action. Now you've done it twice. Now I don't know where to cut. Thanks. Yeah, well... Anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast, Yay. like you said. And today's topic is degrees of false beliefs. Yeah. I can't... I still do, like, disbelief, even though it's not descriptive enough. Yeah, disbeliefs yeah. with like a hyphen. Yeah, dis hyphen belief. That body. First, I mean, we're going to talk about the uh, sort of varying degrees that, that having false beliefs can affect your life and what we think about them. We're going to each pick a favorite conspiracy theory, but first we're going to do an icebreaker and talk about what is your favorite CD that you are listening to lately. CD, mind you. Physical media. I don't remember the last time I listened to CD because I can remember the last CD I bought. All right. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. The last CD I bought and then subsequently ripped it to put onto my iPod. I know. No Apple. So give Apple give us money. Apple did not send us any money for this exactly. or that. Anyways, the last CD I bought was from a band called Akaro, and it was at a Kill Switch Engage show back in December. They were one of the opening bands, and my roommate and I, uh, I bought the tickets just because I went there to go see Kill Switch, and uh, there was also um, Miss May I, and Darkest Hour, and Akaro. No, 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 no! I'm thinking of the wrong show. I I've seen Kill Switch like four times in the last like eighteen months. No, no, this one was Akaro, Shadows Fall, and Kill Switch. It was the first time I saw them after Heavy To. The last time Heavy To ran because it, it didn't go last year. The Mud Pit really turned uh, Donington Park off or whatever that place is. So, anyways, so the first time I saw Kill Switch engage after heavy to yeah it was akaro shadows fall and kill switch there was three massachusetts bands and akaro was the opener uh they were amazing uh performers they were an amazing yeah we'll make sure to link them down below um they were amazing they had amazing stage presence especially the the lead singer and they had the best tagline ever of akaro who the fuck are they they they, they honestly <laughs> did they, they did not take themselves so seriously that they did not realize that they, they were touring with the two biggest names in the Massachusetts metal scene. Well, like the the, the pretty much the biggest. The Massachusetts metal scene like super large. Is that like I'm I'm picturing like like the MIT metal scene? No, I mean like it's it's um it's a self-contained uh, music scene, much in the way Seattle was, or fair much enough, in the way enough. West Coast California was. Um, for new wave American heavy metal. A lot of it came out of that geographic region. Kill Switch Engage. Lamb of God's more from Virginia, but they're still kind of geographically in the what, Mideast, Midwest. Fair enough. M American. Anyways, um, so yeah, uh, we picked up a Caro's. I, I bought a shirt from them and a, and a CD. Does it say who the fuck are they? No, it just has a Caro and really nice, really nice, like not quite death metal scratch things, but... Um, yeah, and it was the the singer who was the guy selling the merch. Nice. And we didn't even realize it at first. And he just like comes over and he shakes her. He's like, you know, thanks a lot for supporting us. And it's like, holy crap! Like this guy's so humble, and you know, the music it, they whipped the crowd up into an amazing frenzy. They were a great opening band. They had a great sense of humor. Played a great set. Uh, and I think they had a song. Um, it was a, no, it wasn't about Macbeth. It was, but it was a, it was a, inspired by Shakespeare. Nice. So, I mean, you can't really go wrong with a band like that. So, that was the last one that I bought. And you sound like you enjoyed it pretty well. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, the last CD, actually, the, the, the CD I've been listening to for like five months now, which is also the last CD I bought, um, I bought at VidCon in California. And it is Lindsay Sterling's CD. Lindsay Sterling is a violinist, and she makes violin dubstep music she has a lot of collaborations with a, with a lot of people and it is brilliant stuff I, th I think she's still topping the charts both on dubstep and classical hmm. um she's done two or three tours now and she did everything on youtube oh wow. so i got the chance to see her perform um both on the main stage and in a in a private workshop 
uh, at VidCon, and I got the chance to meet her, and she's super nice and way shorter than I thought she would be. Everyone's, I think everyone's taller on the internet. <laughs> I'm like six foot nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan's I, like twelve feet tall. But yeah, I just and and drinking water out of my measuring cup. Measuring, I was thirsty and I needed water. <sighs> you were a savage. But yeah, she was she was really super nice, and I wanted to. It was one of the things I went there sort of with a mind to buy. I don't usually buy CDs. I don't. I don't. For a musician, I don't listen to enough music. I sort of have all kinds of random eclectic things, but generally I prefer silence or um, like YouTube videos or blogs or things like that. But I bought my DFTBA wristband, wristband and a T-shirt and a board game, um, and I bought her CD because I I wanted I knew that. If I buy it right there, most of the, it's just like buying it at a concert. Most of the money goes to her, mm-hmm. and I want to support her and her work. Mm-hmm. And I want I get a I get a physical thing, which is kind of cool. And I have been listening to it when I listen to music. It is still in my computer. It is the thing that I listen to because it is really good. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my favorite CD. I think possibly the favorite CD that I own, but that is she doesn't say much because I only own about ten. Yeah. I uh, I've been uh, pirating music for a long time. I actually did want to ask this before we switch over to the main the main topic, but sure. have you found now that a you're out of grad school? I don't know if it changed much when you were in or out of grad school, but also now that you have a stable income source, do you find yourself pirating less? Um. Yes, but. Um, I didn't pirate a lot before that. During during my undergrad, I I, I pirated a lot. Well, actually, I think we talked. I, I I've talked about this before, um, in a different video. Which, if I did, I will put the link in over here. But very briefly, um, the thing I used to pirate a lot was games, mm. and like that was my sort of go-to thing. Was like, only a sucker is going to pay sixty bucks for a video game. Mm. I can get it for free and get it cracked. And that yeah, sure it takes me an extra three hours of work, and I'm I'm three patches behind. But, you know, I you make it work. Mm-hmm. And I got Steam. And when I got Steam about three years ago, I they just made it so affordable to just get games mm-hmm. that all the games that I had pirated, I now own. Mm-hmm. And I bought most of them while I was in grad school because it was, you know, and before I had a, a really solid job and that kind of thing because it was, it was affordable. And, and it's hard to turn down five dollars. The only difference between then and now is now I buy more games and I buy games for more people. Yeah. Because um, I tend to if I if I'm picking up you know a game at the Christmas sale and I see that a couple of my friends it's on their wish list I'll just pick up the four pack and give it to them. Um, but yeah I, I don't I don't really pirate stuff anymore. I mean between Netflix and and YouTube I don't watch a lot of TV or or movies or anymore. I watch a lot of YouTube. Yeah. And. Uh, if you think I should watch your two YouTube videos, leave a comment with your channel, and I'll watch them. Yeah, maybe in the future we'll do oh, our yeah. our <coughs> follow Friday esque style thing. That'd be really we'll, fun. Actually, we'll talk I about. I love talking about my favorite yeah. YouTube channels. I have I, a lot of them. Yeah, so do I. I find, um, yeah, once I got the stable income, and it, it did help, but also I find that. It really is uh, the accessibility issue when things are made accessible and easier to get legitimately you kind of stop you you kind of stop having to pirate like i I got netflix um almost all the shows that i follow that are worth following usually you can get for free from the website Mm -hmm. with like ad obviously you have to have ads um but you can usually stream it legitimately from the site um i still do a little bit of music here and there but it's mostly to test whether or not i'm going to enjoy the whole album because usually with the bands that i listen to a lot of the heavy metal stuff um i'll go out and i'll buy the physical copy to support the bands Mm -hmm. uh so when i when i you know hear the first single off of it i'll usually go to youtube or i might pirate it just to find out what the rest of it sounds like but more often than not if i'm really digging it uh, I'll make sure to go and buy the whole thing, and I'm a I'm a physical copy kind of guy. For some reason, I just can't rationally. I know it makes more sense to buy it cheaper as MP3s, but for some reason, I just prefer to have a physical thing. Fair and enough. That's what I do. My uh, actually, I guess my my big piracy concession is comic books. Mm. Um, I have probably ten twenty thousand comic books um, sitting on my hard drive that I have pirated. I mean, comic books from fifty years ago, comic books from two years ago. Um, 
and that is a thing that that now that only has changed now that I I have a sort of a real grown up job, is whenever my friends and I go to the comic book store, I will always make sure to pick up a couple, um, either up and coming stuff or trade paperbacks of things that I love, mm -hmm. or if you watch the other videos, you can see that on the top shelf right above us, there's a copy of Watchmen sitting there along with uh, a bunch of comics by my friend Trevor. Uh, who makes brilliant autobiographical comics and you can see his link down below he's a super cool guy um and it's that sort of thing is a, that i want to support independent creators and i want to support work that i have enjoyed thoroughly over the past uh, few years and i still have my pirated comic books and i'm not i'm not really ashamed of them and i uh distribute them every once in a while i'm, I'm in the process of giving them to my uh, nine-year-old niece who's really loving comic books and uh so I'm bribing her with them so that she'll practice her guitar, which she also really enjoys but hates practicing. <laughs> but I guess we should actually talk talk about today's topic. Right. Um, so when we say dis like dis hyphen belief or false belief, what I mean, I mean, there's a lot of false beliefs in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess part of the, the the question is what what constitutes a belief, and why are these false beliefs interesting to talk about as opposed to say um, thinking that. Um, the Dalton theory of the atom is correct, mm -hmm. or that uh, glass is a liquid. Glass is not a liquid. Way to confuse everybody. With glass that. is not a liquid. <laughs> glass is liquid. Glass is not a liquid. You might think the glass is a liquid, like I did, but it is not. Yeah. Um. So I would, I would, I would think that a belief is, um. A thought that you have that you endorse that, that, that you hold and endorse and act upon I mean you you may not advocate that other people follow it but at the very least you act upon it yeah I would say it's not so I don't want to go as atomistic as say Locke in terms of ideas I'm, I'm gonna step up a little bit from that but yeah I would say yeah, belief is an idea or perhaps a proposition mm -hmm. that you hold mm -hmm. about something. Uh, and then a little bit deeper than that, uh, it, where it becomes like the, the disbelief versus belief is the, the truth value proposition or Fair the right. truth value of that okay. proposition. So, but I would definitely say at its most basic level, a belief is simply um, an idea or a proposition uh, about something some, I mean, that's fair yeah, that's some fair. Fact. I, I, I usually tie it in with action because i mean your 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 beliefs are usually the things that structure your world um a good example of a false belief is sometimes i'm colorblind um i did a video about that a while back the videos go here links go there links. The videos. we're still sorting this whole podcast thing out I'm new to the um, YouTube. If you are listening to the podcast, don't worry. Every 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 video that I say will go here. You can't see where I'm pointing. Will also go in the show notes. So you're good. Don't <laughs> worry. You're not missing anything. Don't worry. You weren't missing anything anyway. <laughs> but uh, that's not true. Um, no, I am colorblind, and I often have beliefs about colors that are false. They are not true. And I act as if they're true because I can't tell otherwise. Sometimes I think things are red and I say, oh, that's red. And red red goes with certain things and it doesn't go with other things. And they're like, no, no, no. Jim, that's not red. I'm like, yes, it is. It's not. And I know that it's not because there are people who are probably not messing with me most of the time. Hopefully. Well, I got fitted for my first suit uh, uh, last weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a wedding and they were picking out colors and putting them on me and I said oh well this is a very nice green and they said this is a brown suit Jim this is a brown suit <laughs> the upside up one brown suit brown's a good color to have mm -hmm. I, I need to get myself a well I don't know if brown would look good on me but definitely brown suits are pretty classy looking I need to get myself a gray suit but I have a lot of black suits I need to a branch out of the black suits and into the gray suits yeah seriously yeah. i mean he looks like a government agent all the time although i don't suppose a gray suit would help that yeah um but no so i mean that's a like like uh so i mean we describe what a belief is it's a proposition that you hold um that you may, may you know, i guess may or may not act upon but i mean at the very yeah. least i think that, that the stuff we're talking about are are things that you act upon mm -hmm. um and that'll become clearer um so i mean a false belief would be one that isn't true 
Yeah, or, and I don't want to get too too bogged down in, so in case you don't know, we're both philosophy majors. We went yeah. to grad school together. Well, sort of. I mean, I started grad school before you, but you finished before me because I'm lazy. It's a race. Yeah, yeah, it's a race, and he won. Uh, but nevertheless, um, not to get too bogged down in kind of the philosophy of truth and epistemology and whatnot, but I would say beliefs are false when they don't, correspond to something I, there's there's a bunch of different theories about how truth comes about if it corresponds to facts about the world if it coheres with other facts uh deflationary we're gonna, accounts we're gonna sidestep all that yeah we're gonna sidestep all that I'm, I'm just gonna assume a basic kind of correspondence relationship between a belief and something that makes it true so um if i believe that my shirt is yellow mm -hmm. does that correspond to reality yes awesome so that, I mean, that's been a basic thing. So I mean, um, and you want to talk about the the you've done a lot of work with the gambling lab. Yeah. And there's a lot of beliefs that go into sort of how people gamble and how people operate slot machines and mm -hmm. um, a lot of false beliefs. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I I worked with the gambling lab for about two years. Uh, they send me out to casinos to go collect data on slot machines, and you just get talking to various people. Um, and it, it's you meet a lot of really really interesting people, but you also hear some really interesting beliefs about people, about the world, about how like uh, whether or not there is ultimately a conspiracy to take money. And as a researcher, you, there's there's this tension there because obviously you don't want to influence the beliefs of anybody who's going to be participating in your study. Right? You don't want to give them any kind of sense of what it is you're testing because you don't want to bias your, your conclusions. Yeah. So, But for those people who are not going to participate, you also really have to avoid being confrontational and trying to educate them. And this is something uh, one of the other researchers who's with us, uh, we'll call him Carl. Um, is that because that's his name? <laughs> we'll call him Carl, whether or not it's his name or not, but I like the name Carl. But Carl once uh, was talking to this gentleman, and this gentleman had this you know, really specific set of beliefs about how the slot machines work and how the OLG, you know, takes money. And, uh, and I asked Carl about it afterwards, you know, just why were you so confrontational about it? And he says, well, I mean, we, I think the university is missing or is often underplaying its responsibility in public education. We get, we spend so much of our time, stuck in our ivory towers and working on our own pro projects that we often forget that we as an institution have a responsibility to share knowledge and to help educate people in the outside world and it, it's really interesting when you go to a casino and you listen to people just those kinds of beliefs that they have to explain things to be able to rationalize what they see when it comes to gambling with slot machines because as Carl and I both believe the, the the rules of which have been set up by the OLG are not unfair. They're very clear set rules and the rules are they're they're transparent. But it's the, the beliefs that get attributed with, you know, like how what your chances of winning are and the addictive side of gambling. That's where the problem comes from. Um, and so, yeah, you just run into some really... So an example is, I guess, would be something like, I mean, the, obviously the gambler's fallacy is one of yeah. those, where you believe that um, past past outcomes influence future outcomes. Yeah, do theory. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you you're 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 sitting there and you're like, oh well, I've lost the last th thirteen spins, which means I'm due for a, a win any time now. Yeah. And on slot machines, on gambling in general, that's not true. Gambling is random. I mean, mm -hmm. the slot machines are probably less random than other things in gambling. No, gambling no, in no, general. No, that's that. No. Oh, okay. It is. It's I don't actually know how slot machines work. So. Okay. Oh, okay. So I let's let's take it a step back. Let's explain what a slot machine is. A slot machine is essentially a random number generator. And Fair enough. All it is, it's running. It's the random number generator is running all the time, and then all that happens is when you hit spin, it selects whatever numbers are in there, and then it displays the outcome in a graphic form. Okay. It is no more or less random than pretty much anything else that does not have a bias. In fact, biased gambling is illegal. Like you cannot have any kind of bias built in there. Oh. You can hedge 
the outcomes and pay and set up your pay tables in such a way that favor certain outcomes mm-hmm. but that's that's ultimately how that's a, that's a payout is. structure it doesn't yeah right. it, it doesn't i mean i mean i mean as opposed to gambling like poker where i mean poker is probably I, I i don't i don't know a lot about gambling to be fair before i say this but probably i would think that poker is one of the least random games because poker is a game about skill yeah the like, only like the skilled poker player is going to beat an unskilled poker player hmm. most of the time. Yeah. And it's not bad luck when they do. It's skill and practice and training. In the same way that, you know, a skilled boxer will beat up me yeah. every day of the week, any day. Yeah. In order to be a legitimate uh, betting form or gambling game, there must be some element of randomness. Like It, it cannot be fixed. Mm. If there, it, Think about it this way. If you ever have, if you can ever have a successful strategy, then it's not a gamble. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. There must always be a chance that you can lose, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the games can't have varying degrees of control. So as you say, a professional poker player, anybody who knows what they're doing can take advantage of knowing what the cards are, the communal cards on the table, knowing what you have in your pocket and based on somebody else's betting strategy, making an educated guess as to whether or not your cards are better or worse than theirs. Yep. Uh, and then that, but that takes into account that the, there is a certain element of memory involved in that. Like the deck yeah. doesn't have memory. It doesn't remember what cards are in there mm-hmm. from, from hand to hand, but you can remember the betting strategies of somebody else. And therefore you can make educated guesses as to what they're doing, yeah. whether or not they have a legitimate hold or whether or not they're bluffing and skilled players will, you know, vary these, these strategies, but overall for gambling in general, you can never have a successful strategy. So you must always, there must always be some uncontrolled element of the game in order for it to be a gamble. And I think these false beliefs sort of, sort of arise when people try and say, take control of that. I mean, I mean, you look at things like, uh, what's, what's another fallacy that gamblers use? The sharpshooter fallacy. Well, yeah, sharpshooter is more about statistical. So like you, you know, the the Texas sharpshooter goes up to a barn shoots a bunch of rounds into the wall and then goes around and draws a circle around a grouping and then says, you know, that, that these, this grouping is somehow statistically significant. Yeah. I mean, so you look at machines that, that are, that are paying out Mm. and you say, Oh, these are machines that pay out. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they're just machines that are paying out right now when you are seeing them Mm -hmm. and it has no bearing. I mean, it, and it, it mixes together with gambler's fallacy, but all in all, it seems sort of relatively harmless. I mean, the issue, the, the a lot of the, I think a lot of the issues surrounding uh, gambling, and I mentioned this before the podcast too, is, is you know if if you have gambled away your life savings, I don't think the problem is that you you have a false belief with regard to the gambler's fallacy. I mean there there are there are much deeper problems at work there, mm-hmm. um, of which that is maybe a symptom, but it is certainly not the underlying cause. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are other there are other kinds of false beliefs that. Uh, affect the way people structure their whole lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why we want to talk about conspiracy theories. <laughs> yes. Good old conspiracy theories. Oh, man. You can't go very long in a comment section without running into some sort of conspiracy theory. So what is your favorite conspiracy theory? Uh, it's kind of hard to narrow them down, but one that kind of hits with some... Like, I have a, a friend or two who subscribed to this or at least have argued with me about it. And as a benign one is probably uh, Hollow Earth. Um, is that the lizard people one? Pardon? Is that the lizard people one? Sometimes they're bound up together. Sometimes oh. lizard people live in Hollow Earth. Because I had lizard people. No, 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 no. Hollow okay. Earth. Okay. Hollow Earth is, is I don't know simply, about this one. So I don't know much about it either because I don't, like it just doesn't make any sense to me. And anytime I've tried to understand it, it just doesn't make sense. But hollow earth essentially is that the earth's crust is so deep and then in like beyond that point it is a hollow earth now sometimes it's coupled with expanding earth so that the earth is expanding and that explains continental drift and whatnot like i said um neil adams kind of explains continental drift with 
an expanding Earth theory. Uh, but I don't think necessarily the two are always tied up. I think you can, you can't have one without the other. But yeah, Hollow Earth basically just says what is inside the Earth? Like, is it full of nougat? Probably lizard people. But I'll let you cover lizard. <laughs> like people. it's it's just I now no now I'm intrigued by this thought that the Earth has this creamy, delicious caramel center. Uh, but the like, moon. What made would you cheese, put in there? So. The I mean, I guess it's, what was it, Lost World, where the Earth was full of, like, dinosaurs? And there yeah. was an internal sun or something like that? I don't remember. If it yeah, I mean, world. like, I, I, maybe Hollow Earth was what... No, I don't feel like a real nerd anymore. <laughs> maybe Hollow Earth was what inspired Dyson Spheres and stuff. Or maybe the, the two... Are no, no, Dyson Spheres are totally different. Dyson Spheres encase a whole solar system. Well, just think of a mini sun inside of the planet as being well, a small guess, microcosm. But yeah. but I think the idea is, like, yeah, you can walk Dyson on Spheres the... Dyson spheres are cool, and I don't want them tainted by his conspiracy theories. No, yeah, yeah, no, 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 don't get me wrong. <laughs> my, one of my favorite track... Well, not, like, most favorite, but one of my favorite track episodes is the Dyson Sphere when they discovered Scotty in oh, Stasis. So I know, such a good episode. But, yeah, I guess mine, mine is lizard people. Yeah. Um, because, again, it, it, it seems benign. Like, uh, there's a lot. I mean, it's definitely not the wor- the sort of worst one out there. I mean, there's there's 9-11 truthers and there's Holocaust deniers. And if you are either of these things, I invite you to not comment and share this. Because, really, like, um, like it just it digs up, it opens up old wounds and it's not good for anybody. Um, same with, I mean, anti-Zionist conspiracy theorists and things like that. You're invited to, to, I don't know, watch a different video on a different channel, <laughs> any other channel. Yeah. But, uh, except people that I like, cause don't go, no. But, um, no, lizard people though, like lizard people seem so harmless, but also so delightfully imaginative. The amount of effort you have to go to. To try and prove that the Queen of England is a, is a lizard person in disguise. Part of a long line of lizard people who are secretly ruling the earth is so incredible that it, it, it's one of those fundamentally interesting powers of human imagination. And at the same time, I mean, not a lot of people getting upset about lizard people. I mean, apart from people who believe in lizard people. But again, it, it, so, I mean, conspiracy theories... And this leads us into the into the conspiracy theory sort of segment is that they they don't just structure the way you view a specific thing like like slot machines or, mm-hmm. or poker tables or roulette or something mm-hmm. or even you know how gambling works overall or how casinos work or the larger st- sort of infrastructure of of a governmental gambling establishment. We live in Ontario and the government runs all the casinos. Mm-hmm. The, they have a they have a crown corporation that sort of runs everything and it makes it makes money that goes into things like healthcare, mm-hmm. which is super cool. Big fan of healthcare. Yeah. Um, but I mean, your conspiracy theory structures the way that you see the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think, if you honestly hold the belief that the government is covering up um, the existence of aliens, or you know, if they are secretly ruled by lizard people, or if um, geologists and seismologists are lying and part of this giant conspiracy to to keep the nougat of the hollow earth from the people who need it most. I really want to know what's in the hollow earth now. <laughs> also, I'm hungry. We should probably just throw a wiki link. Yeah, we'll, there. we'll get a Wikipedia link down below and I, I will have sated my, my, my hunger for nougat and possibly also knowledge. <laughs> Um, but I mean, you have to, you have to construct a universe in which these things are true. I mean, you have to, you mentioned earlier, you have to explain away all kinds of coincidences, all kinds of, um, happenstance. And you have to, you, cause you can't live in a world like that. You have to live in a world where this makes sense. I mean, earlier we, we talked um, like before the cast, we talked about uh, Newtown and the shooting that happened there last year and how if you live in a world that is run by conspiracies, you can't just have bad things happening to good people. There's got to be a reason for it. Everything has to have a mover or a shaker or something that caused that and it's part of some greater conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And I guess, I don't know, that makes it, it really seems kind of, kind of sad. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm certainly not a fan of bad things happening to good people, but... I mean, and maybe it's my pessimistic philosopher brain that tells me that, you know, sometimes life is just miserable. 
Yeah. But sometimes life is just miserable. Yeah, suffering is inevitably bound up in, in the human experience. Yeah. Well, not just human, but yeah. It's uh it's just it's just really weird when you have benign false beliefs. Yeah, I mean, social media is just rife with them. You just go into your Facebook feed and there's some sort of weird thing about Monsanto or Big Pharma. I got this privacy notice that protects all my Facebook stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Are also this the everything that happens in this episode you can find on Snopes. <laughs> Snopes is the most wonderful site on the internet. It, I yes, I have definitely copied and pasted many a Snopes article into comment threads. But just the the main thing is that you have this varying this continuum of false beliefs. But at at one end is these benign ones, but at the other end is ones that just completely inform and distort i'm gonna say distort i'm gonna come out and just be like harsh about it it distorts the way you view reality much in the same way your color blindness distorts your reality i mean you can still see but you're not seeing the truth out there and sometimes these false belief webs they would say the same thing about you my friend yeah you can if you want but <laughs> you're just a shill for uh <laughs> for the uh dye color industry complex um but yeah, so you, die color <laughs> complex is my Beatles cover band. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you have you have this web of beliefs that completely distorts reality and informs your decision making and how you live your life. So that not only is it influencing you, but it starts to influence other people, um, or you're making decisions on behalf of other people, and it can it can be dangerous. Yes, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think the weirdest thing about conspiracy theories is that the simultaneous notion that. The conspiracy is so intricate and so vast and so well concealed that it is hidden from almost everyone in the world except for a tiny group of people who are ordinary but are sharp enough to have figured it out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like a modern day zombie apocalypse because in the zombie apocalypse is an apocalypse that you can deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll probably do a whole episode about apocalypses. It'll be fun. We'll bring in uh, Dan because Dan really loves talking about the end of the world. But if you if you you're in a zombie apocalypse, it's not like you know an economic apocalypse where everything just stops working or a meteor hitting the earth where everyone just dies. Mm -hmm. You know, a zombie apocalypse. If you're smart enough, if you're ingenious enough, if you're ruthless enough, you can get by. Mm -hmm. You can you can even thrive. You can become a king. Or a queen in the zombie apocalypse, you know, by being skilled and by having the right set of skills and the right and being prepared in the right ways, and the conspiracy thing sort of seems like that same idea that that you know, you are the one who is prepared in the right ways. Everyone else is living in the dark about about what this thing is. It creates this sort of, I almost want to, I, I almost want to call it hubris. I mean, this, this overweening pride in, in your own abilities that, that clouds out all the details that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that is probably harmful. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably harmful to certainly your relationships. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know that something that is harmful to employment prospects is really a real kind of harm. Um, I mean, in the, in the sense that there are lots of things that are completely irrelevant that are harm, harmful to employment prospects, like tattoos. Mm -hmm. But I certainly think that, that it, it would, I mean, I don't know, I find, I find conspiracy theories very difficult to deal with, but that might be because I am who I am and, and not be necessarily because they are who they are. Um, well, from our point of view, there's there's two levels of harm. Like, from, a, from us as philosophers, there's a kind of offensive... How can you believe these things if they're false? Especially if they're demonstrably false. Like lizard people. Like lizard people. Um, I guess lizard people is actually kind of unfalsifiable. Uh, I suppose. Like So uh, before the show, we were talking a little bit about the the no. conspiracy <laughs> theory, the, the preconditions to have a conspiracy theory. Like you really need, you need a, a, a often a kind of just world fallacy view that you know good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people so therefore anything that happens that's bad you know it happens for a reason or at least there's intentionality behind it um what else did i say you need oh man i wish i had my notes in front of me but... <laughs> um yeah this is going back a whole two hours but you need to <laughs> 
No, one of, one of the things you, you mentioned is that you, you need to be able to explain away um, everything, everything that doesn't fit while finding inconsistencies with reality. Or at least, at the very least, what you what you wind up seeing as as part of reality. I think I think that inconsistencies with reality is maybe a little a little harsh. Yeah, as you said, you know, you poke holes in the theory, you uh, reject reality and substitute your own. But by substituting your own, you're, it's completely uh, immune or not immune. It's completely beyond the point of you allowing other people to to poke holes in it. Yeah, exactly. right. Anyone who 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 would try is is in on it or or the, or they've been duped by it mm-hmm. and i mean you see i unfortunately i see this with a lot of of conspiracy theory stuff so i i always remember um it was about it came out about two years ago there was a, a 9-11 truth parody of rebecca black's friday and i watched it because i like watching parodies of rebecca black's friday i also like the original for different reasons that's a conspiracy. No, nah, it's a long story, but <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile story. But and it was just, I mean, it spent so much time, you know, talking about er, and 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 making fun of people who had been duped by by the man. You know, you know those people, the sheeple. I hate that word so much. <laughs> but I mean, it, and again, it, it comes back to that sort of pridefulness. I think that that poses a real problem i mean it doesn't help that there are real conspiracies that have happened watergate was a real conspiracy yeah but we're talking about two different levels of conspiracy yeah. like usually conspiracy theory is a more pejorative you know idea of well and it's a it's a it's an actual technical logical fallacy is where, yeah where you know the the absence of evidence does not indicate the evidence the evidence of ab- nah, i can never get that right on my first try yeah Absence of evidence does not indicate evidence of absence. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you know, the fact that there is no evidence for something doesn't mean that it's just been covered up. There might just be no evidence. Like, it might just not be there at all. Um, but that, I guess, I mean, they, they, like I said, they, they, I guess there are varying degrees of, of harmfulness. But nothing, I think, nothing beats our third false belief, <laughs> which is the anti-vaccine movement. Yeah, speaking of kind of a conspiracy, but it's not really, it's a, it's kind of like a pseudo conspiracy theory almost because it's, it's, it's less to do with big pharma and more to do with people just not really understanding immunology, virology, chemistry, basic, um, pop, um, not pop health, but, um, well, popul- health, health of populations and yeah. whatnot. Like it just, it's it's such a weird, weird thing that it's a, it is a thing. Well, and it, it's um, I read a blog post recently that, that sort of pre- presented it as a debate, but it's sort of not. I mean, did, not everything that has two sides is a de- is a debate. There's no heads or tails. The debate. It's just heads or tails. And this is the same way. I mean, I mean, on one side, there's the the vast opinion of what 60 to 70 years of medical evidence probably more mm-hmm. and on the other side there are people who are upset about something yeah and i mean there's a there's a notion of parental responsibility but realistically even if the additives in in vaccines have grievous long-term effects which they don't um but even if they did those effects would have to be worse than polio for them to be even be relevant in the equation like they would they would have to be so bad that they would have to be killing people and they're not i mean they are they're everything we have says that vaccines are incredible even your you know, even your flu shot but especially vaccines that, that give us herd immunity to all kinds of diseases there are more and more vaccines because we are beating more and more diseases we are beating diseases that have plagued mankind for thousands of years and yes there are also new diseases that are screwing everyone over but that is always going to be the case it is a medical arms race i don't know it just it it, that is a thing and and, i mean and, and and not vaccinating can can cost you i mean it it can cost you limbs it can cost you your health Mm -hmm. it can cost you your life in extreme circumstances right and more importantly like especially i mean a lot of the anti-vaccine movement centers around parents 
And to be to be perfectly fair, neither of us have kids. Yeah. Full disclosure. Yeah, but that we know of. That we know of. Yeah. Um, that would be weird. Mm. But uh, no, it, I mean, there's a sense in which you know parents do need to be responsible for their children, but. Um, I mean, vaccinating your kids is the responsible thing to do. It it protects them from things that you are otherwise impossible to protect them from. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's there. There was a, a campaign a while back about passing around like lollipops from kids who had chicken pox and things like that. You know, to develop immunity. Well, or you could just get the vaccine, and it does the same thing only better. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I want to I wanna kind of bring up two points that I think... We talked about this before the show, or before when we were preparing, but um, they both al- rely on the same thing, and this this idea of personal experience. A lot of times with anti-vaxxers or climate change deniers, there tends to be this emphasis on either personal experience or experience of trusted others that are only within a couple degrees of separation. Uh, so the first point that I, I read about, so I was reading the Globe and Mail today and they had a discussion about it and it was uh, poll results, and we'll put the links down below, uh, poll results of people's attitudes towards anti-vaccines, or sorry, t- towards vaccines and why they don't get it. And some 49% of the Canadian population won't get vaccinated for various reasons. And the two big ones, uh, 35 or 36% um, don't like don't believe or don't agree with what's in the vaccine. So they have a problem with the vaccine itself. And then 35 to 36% of the people will not get it because they never get the flu. And I'm always baffled by this uh, because that line of thinking is the same as saying, well, I never wear my car, my, my seatbelt. You never wear your car seat? Yeah, I never wear my my car car seat seat in years. Anyways, but I never wear a seatbelt because I never get thrown through my car windshield. Like the point is not that you do this with a regular frequency that you get sick. It's the idea that you, you get the flu shot or you wear your seatbelt to try to prevent more harm from happening. Cause I mean, we're, let's make a concession here with a vaccine for the flu shot. It doesn't protect you 100%. It boosts it by like 40% your, your resistance to getting it, or at least it mitigates it. The problem is, is that's 40% that you didn't have if you didn't get the vaccine. I guess to harken back to our gambling point, um, is that if you were playing a slot machine where you knew that the odds of winning were 40% better, why would you play any other machine? So so there is that element. It's just people who say, like, I never get sick or I never get it. Obviously, there's other things going on when it comes to protecting yourself from the flu. I mean, r- r- limiting the amount of time you're exposed to people with the flu. Proper hand-washing techniques, making sure that you're not uh, exposing the like, open open. Uh, mucous membranes or open wounds to to getting infected not stop <laughs> motorboating people with the flu yeah stop it especially if they're cut stop it so obviously there are those things but nevertheless like the flu shot is such a small cost to prevent something that could be a lot worse especially because right now h1n1 is the current uh, the current strain that's making the, the rounds. H1N1 in 2009 was the biggest like threat to us. It was the one that was predicted to be the global pandemic because it typically doesn't affect the old and young in the way a normal flu season does, but in fact usually attacks uh, healthy, uh, m- not middle-aged, but the middle group between old and young. So, I mean, for such a low cost, especially because it's in, in Canada our government provides it, why wouldn't you want to get it? As you said, like the cost of getting the vaccine somehow outweighs like, okay, it's, I'm not going to get the vaccine because I am perfectly fine to live with polio or I'm perfectly fine to get the flu. They get polio just, builds character. Yeah. And it's crooked spine and stuff. So also that well, you could become captain America. That might be a precondition. He had polio in the original series. Did he? I didn't know that. I think so. I don't think so. I think he was just small. We should find out. Anyway, <laughs> so that was point number one. Point number two, uh, going back to placing personal uh, emphasis, is people will often think, like, I either got sick. There's this kind of technical term here, post hoc ergo propter hoc. So because... After the thing. Yeah. Therefore, because of the thing. Yeah, so I get the flu shot. I get sick after the flu shot. Therefore, it's because of the flu shot I got sick. 
in some cases, yes, you do get sick from from a reaction to it. I mean, people with egg allergies are encouraged not to get the flu, or it's only in, in circumstance, uh, in, in extreme uh, circumstances. But people will often put so much value on you know their experiences of like, I only got sick afterwards, and it's a lot of the times it's the same thing that what happened with the last polar vortex, where people you know saw that the temperatures dropped to negative 30 or negative 40 and made also the other thing i hate that stupid meme that went around that you know, canada or winnipeg was colder than mars i hate that it was so stupid the cbc thank you cbc you ran an amazing article dispelling how why that was so stupid you people should read more from the cbc and keep funding the cbc <laughs> by you people <laughs> Anyway, I don't know that our <laughs> listeners are capable of funding the entire CBC. Uh, just pay your taxes, uh, Stephen and, Harper. If you're watching, yeah, please, please give the CBC more money. They do good, um, very good things. CBC I, did not pay us for that. No, they did but, not. I just love the CBC. But anyways, after the last polar vortex, there was a number of people, kind of jokingly, but in some some case seriously, saying like, "Oh, what's this deal about climate change and global warming?" And like the, the the most vocal people who are defending climate change were saying look your individual experience your one piece of data of it happening to be unseasonably cold does not change a global trend like your your little blip is an outlier it's not even an outlier your blip is just static or it's just background noise sadly in what's going on statistics does not care about your feelings nor does it care how cold you get even no. when it's really cold even when it's almost possibly but not really colder than mars um, with that, we will leave you with from the fr broadcasting from the frozen north currently. Yeah, and it's about to get colder too, right? I don't want to talk it about it. Okay. This Saturday, I'm jumping into a giant pool of frozen water. Uh, there might be videos of that. There will definitely be videos of that, unfortunately. I am going to freeze my nutsack off. <laughs> and with that lovely mental image, we will leave you. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we'll see you guys later. Stay awesome. Every fucking time. I'm not even in my seat yet. <laughs>